Okay, Stefan, when you're ready, uh, please feel free to start. Okay. Uh, so with, but I should probably introduce you first, right? For uh, all yes. the uh, all the attendees. Um, so, <laughs> thank you everybody uh, for coming in and watching Stefan talk. So, uh, Stefan is a functional Scala developer. Um, he's been writing code for Scala code for about five years, and he co-organizes the Paris Scala Users Group. Um, he's very interested in lambda calculus and type theory, and so. I think of him as my Prosian alter ego. Um, <laughs> so today he's going to give us a tour of the many forms of polymorphism. Um, please welcome Stefan. I know that unfortunately you don't have uh, your audio on so you can't clap, but I'll, I'll clap for Stefan. <laughs> Thank you very much. So welcome everyone. The, the title of the talk is Polymorphism, what into, until you see my true power. So I'm Stefan Tanqua. This is the link to my GitHub, my Twitter, and there is also this is there is also my my blog. Now we publish the the slides of this talk uh, of the uh, of the talk I've uh, already present before on my on my my blog. So so the title of the talk is inspired by a sentence. Uh, of this character, which is Frieza. And just like, just as polymorphism, Frieza has many forms. So as we evolve in the talk, I will, I will present more advanced forms of polymorphism and you will see more, more advanced form of Frieza. So uh, before starting, I want to, to give the syntax of the, the language I will use for my examples. So the first language I will use because I love that language is Scala, right? So this is the syntax of Scala. Right there I'm defining a value named value. If the, the val keyword is to, is to say that my value is immutable. And this is the type of my value. Then I define a tuple of integer and string. Uh, right there I'm defining a function, named function with the def keyword, right? And that function takes an input parameter and an input of type integer and return a string. Then I define the function as a value Right, with the val keyword, and that function is a lambda, will be a lambda function. Uh, on the last three lines, I define an alternative. An alternative is a, a, a variant type, is an alternative between two, two records. The first record is record one with two fields, label one of type Boolean and label two of type, of type car. And this is the second record, right? The second language I will use, for my example, is Haskell. And as, like Haskell has like to, to say, we should all learn Haskell for Greek Google, so that's what we will see today. So we we'll see some Haskell today. So in Haskell, remember that on the first line we define the we give the signature of of a value or of a, fun, or of a function, then we give an implementation. So right there, I'm defining a value of type string, and this is the signature of my value, and then this is and then I give the implementation. Right there, I'm defining a tuple of integer and string. I'm defining the function from integer to string. And this is the implementation. And this is the same, but my function here is a lambda, is a lambda function. And uh, right there, this is a variant type. So it's, it's an alternative between the record one, Boolean car, and the record two, string int. And look here, so we'll see also the syntax of, of TypeScript, right? So this is how to define a value in TypeScript. And the const keyword, the const keyword is to say that my value is immutable. This is how to define a function with the function keyword. And that function takes a number and input and returns a string. This is also a function as a value. And name the, uh, you just note that uh, in the type of the function and I put the name of the parameter. And this is how to define a record with two fields, label one of type Boolean and label two of type car. This is how to define another record. And this is that the, the variant type is an alternative between two records. There's a little difference, but it's not doesn't matter for this talk. So I will now no, I just want to give a quick recap about polymorphism. So in the in 1985, Carl Wegner gave a classification of the various form of polymorphism at this time, and the class they, 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 they come up with, with this classification where we have parametric polymorphism, inclusion polymorphism, which is in the group and universal. And this talk will focus on, on those two forms of polymorphism. So we, we, we won't talk about other forms of polymorphism like other polymorphism. There, there, is, there is another talk in the conference which talk about type classes. So 
Feel free to see it. Uh, now I want to give an example of what parametric polymorphism is. And in Scala to achieve parametric polymorphism, in my example, I will define a, a length function, which that function takes a, a list and will compute the size of that list. So this is how to define my function length. That function takes a type parameter and my function will take will take an input parameter list, which is a list of A of my time parameter, and will turn an integer, which is the size of, the size of the list. And when I will call that function, I will I'll, I will have to specify the type of the list. So right there, I'm specifying the type A to int. So the compiler will infer that the input parameter is of type list of A, right? And note that when I will implement my function, my, the implementation of my function doesn't know the type A, so it's agnostic to A. It should work for, for any A, right? In Haskell, this is how to define the length function. So that function will go from a list of A to an integer. And note that in Haskell, every character which is unknown to the compiler will be considered as a type parameter. So as A is unknown to the compiler, it's, it's considered as a type parameter. And this is how to achieve this is how to implement the length function, the length function in, in touch rate, right? We, and the only difference with Scala is to use the, instead of the, the brackets, we use the that signs, right? So now we talk about inclusion. So before, I want to give first a definition of inclusion. So a type A is included in, or is a subtype of another type B, when all values of type A are also values of type B. Especially exactly when A considered as a set of value is a subset of B. So if an example in Scala in, in TypeScript, because Haskell doesn't support subtyping. In Scala, we achieved we achieved inclusion with subtyping and inheritance. So if I have a class person with two fields, name, string, and age int, I have a class employee, which extends from person, right? With an extra extra field, is manager of type boolean. If I have an employee, then that value, that employee could be assigned to a variable expecting a person, right? So that is inclusion. An employee is also a person. In TypeScript, if I have that report person, with two fields, name, string, and age number, I have that report employee with an extra parameter, an extra, extra field, excuse me, is manager boolean. If I have a value of type employee, I can assign that value of type employee to variable expecting a person. Why? Because so in, what's the difference between the two? In TypeScript, I don't have to, to explicitly write that my employee is a, sub, is a subtype of person because the subtyping relationship will be, will be inferred based on the structure of the, the two records. Whereas in, type, whereas in, in Scala, I have to explicitly specify that that employee is a, sub, is a subtype, is a subclass of person with the extent keyword. So this is structural subtyping and this is nominal subtyping. Now I want to talk quickly about existential types. So when you write, when there's a similar, this is parametric types are very similar to the universal quantification that we use with that keyword in, mat, in, in mathematics, especially in logic. And if I write, something like this in my type system. This means for all type A, expression P as type T of A, right? So when I will create a value or implement a function of that type, the type A will be unknown in, in the implementation. So the implementation is agnostic to that type A. Whereas when I will call a, a value, I use a value or call a, or use a function of that type, I have to set the type A. So the type A is only known at the call site. Then if I, if I, instead of writing this, I'm writing this if, uh, by using this sign of mathematics. In our type system, this, mean, this means for some type A, expression P as type T of A. And what, what's the, the, the implication of that? So uh, that type A will be known when I, when I will implement or create a value of that type. So that type A will be known. And 
the implementation will depend on that on a on that type a right but at the call site when i will use a value or use a function of that type i won't be able to know the type a right so that's the difference between the two and with existential quantification the purpose of existential quantification is to hide the type inside the type right you will see that with an example if i define this type t like this for some a i have this record value of you have this record with a field which is value of type a and a function from a to int right if i declare a value of type t i will set a type to a which is int my example for the value x and then i will give the value for x and if i have that if uh if after the implementation after the definition of x if i have the value x i won't be able to do anything on it except taking that value and pass it to the, to the function so this is an abstract interface this is a modular interface right so how to have existential type in, in Scala? The, the, there is an easy way to have an existential type. For example, if I have a list of integer and I assign that list of integer to a list of underscore of that sign, right there, um, I will hide the type of, I will hide the type integer. So I won't be, uh, won't be able to know after my definition, to know the type of an element inside, inside my list. So if I try to call head for head, for example, I will get an in. And by the way, this is this is very interesting. I will come I will come to that later. So there is another way to have an existential type in Scala. The other way, one of the other way is to define a tree like this with an abstract type, type A. And when I will define the value x1 of uh, when I will when I will define the value of x1. I won't be able to know. I will lose the, the, the type of that value. I will set a, I set a value right there, but after afterwards, I'm not able to know what's the type of A. It's hidden to me because I will. It's just known when I what I will implement that value. And there is another way to have an existential type in Scala. If I have a tree like this, I have, I have an implementation of that tree with a type with a type parameter. If I have a value of x2, I know that that value is an instance of that class, the declared the implementation class. But I won't be I won't be able to know the type of the a inside my value because that type will be hidden to me. It's an, it's an the, the type a is exist, is existential. Excuse me. So now this is what this was just on. Um, and I miss Bush, like we say in French. So I hope you're ready for the, the big stuff. And the, in this section, we'll see what we could mix exist the quantification and, and subtyping to write more powerful and unexpressive expressive programs. So we'll first start by seeing what, what we get when we mix parametric polymorphism with subtyping, right? So I will start with an example. That example I define as a function f, which takes uh, records like this, one of type number, and returns the value of one. If I call it with an instance of that record right there, or with a subtype of it, I will get I will get the, the, the value of the first one, which is a for my two examples. Then if I call it with one with one true, I will get a compiler because true is not uh, doesn't have doesn't belongs to the type number. True belongs to the type boolean and, I'm, and my function expects the value of one to be a number, right? So this is logic. Then if I have another function like this, but instead of instead of relying on subtyping, I text I, I take a type parameter A and I specify that that type parameter is a subtype of my record one and number, right? And the implementation Still the same. And I just use the type parameter for the type of my input of my input parameter. If I call it with a, a, an instance of that record or with a subtype of it, it'll be the same. And I will also get it to, to the compiler. But what's the difference between the two? You just see that right there with subtyping, the inclusion relationship 
in my input parameter is implicit. I just expect my input to be of that type. And if you give me a subtype of, the, of it, it, it will work, it, it, it works. But with that version, my subtyping relationship is explicit, right? And this is easier to, this is more convenient. This is, the, uh, the, this one, this version is more complicated, but it's more powerful and we'll see that in, in a moment. And this is what I just said. And what I want you to remember is that if you have this kind of type for all A of a type T, this is actually equivalent to for all A, which is a sub, which is a subtype of any of the type T. And this explains what, why we, why we, we get the type any when we call, when we call add on the list on of underscore, right? Because this looks like for all, uh, for all some A, which is a subtype of any of the type A. And so we we'll get just the upper bound. And so with an example, we'll see how powerful we, what power we get by mixing subtyping and parametric polymorphism. In that, exam, in that example, I define a type point, which is a record with, with two fields, X number and Y number. I define a type tile, which is a subtype of record with two more fields. And if I define that function, move X zero, which takes a point and a, a DX of type number, and that function will just add that dx to the x coordinate of my point, right? And just return to return that point. If I call it with an instance of point and one, and I call x on it, I will get the I will get a result. If I call it an instance of a tile, right, and one, and I call r on it, I want to get that field of the, the of my tile. I will get a compiler of Why? Because this is actually simple because right there, as my function expects a point, if I pass a tile, that tile will be upcast to a point, right? But I will just, I will, so I will lose the type information or that, uh, that I have on tile. So I will lose that, the, the, the type information about those two fields, right? So this is, uh, I will just see that I have a point but the, the value of that point as actually another, as an actual type, which is a tile. So this type, this tile type will be existential after afterwards. And <clears throat> if I define that move X function like this, with type parameter, which extends from point. And if I take a point, a, 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 an input of P, of type P, a number and a DX of type number with the, the same implementation. If I call it with an instance of point, I will get the same result. But if I call it an instance of tile and I try to call R on it, I will get, I will, this will actually compile because I won't, uh, I won't lose any type information, right? With this version. So with bounded quantification, this is more interesting and more powerful as I just said before. And that explicit subtyping constraint helps, helps me not lose type information. And by the way, you, you, you just see that with OOP, OOP is closely related to, to existential quantification in the sense that if I have a super type like, super type like this, this is quite similar to, to saying that for some type A, which is a subtype, which is a subtype of point, of the type A, right? All I will all I will know is that my type A is a subtype of points, and I don't, I don't actually I don't know the actual type of my value. And by the way, by mixing subtyping with quantification, we call it on polymorphism, right? Now we'll see what we what we get when we try to mix existential quantifications or existential types with uh, subtyping, right? And by doing this, what we want, what we really want to, to write is something like this for some A, which is a subtype, which is a subtype of T1 of my expression as type T2 of A, right? So with that abstractly, with that existential quantification bound by, bound by upper type, 
what I uh, express a type which is unknown to me, which is hidden, right, the type A. But I give a little bit more information about A, and the information I gave is that that type is a, is a subtype of T1. So that type A is not more abstract than T1, right? So with this, with this kind of quantification, if you bound right there, uh, I'm expressing uh, subtyping relationships in between two types, but I don't know how the relationship holds. It is because the, the the type is hidden to me. I don't know the, the implementation. I don't do the, I don't know the details, but I don't. I just know that there is a type which is hidden to me. That type has a subtyping relationship from another type. That's it. And by the way, if I have this kind of type. For some a t of a, this is similar to for some a, which is a subtype of any t of a, right? And I will I will show an example of mixing subtyping with a special quantification. So in my example, I want to define this kind of module, the time module, right? The time module will have will have type p, which is an abstract type. We'll have a type t, which is an abstract type, but t is a sub is a subtype of p, right? And I have four methods. One to build a value of type T. One to get a value of type P from a, a T. Excuse me. Excuse me. One to get that value from a T and one to get that value from a T, right? And I know that I have, well, I have excuse me, I have two, two type, point and tile. Tile is a subtype of point, but I don't know, I don't know anything about those, those two types. Then for the implementation, I will know the type. And I will, as I know the type, I will give the implementation for my for my for my time module. So for the implementation, I will set P to point, I will set T to tile, and I will implement the method, right? And you just note that uh, we could we could just note that uh, in my implementation, tile is not a direct subclass of point because tile is a subclass of segment which is a subclass of point right but right there um this is good with the constraints that t should be a, a subtype of point of p right so in if i have a function like this which takes time module as an input parameter that function will be able to build a tile get r from a tile I get the R value from a tile, get the value from a tile, send them up. And without even knowing, without even knowing what's the type of T and what's the type of P, right? That type will be hidden, will be as will be as abstract, but my function will be able to manip to create values of that type and manipulate them. So that's very interesting. And now we will see more from polymorphism. This is the last part of the talk. Right, so the, the first thing I want to show, the first one I want to show that in that section is row polymorphism. So row polymorphism was introduced by Mitchell one in that paper, and it was implemented in PerfScript. This is the, the first language, the first language uh, I know which offer type of uh, row polymorphism. It's coming Naskel, by the way. The idea of row polymorphism is to be polymorphic on the field of a record. And by the way, a field of a record is a row. So that's why we call it row polymorphism, right? So uh, why, what it means to be polymorphic on the field of a record. So what I want to do is to be able to describe a record like this in, a, in such a way that record as, as a field A1 of type T1 up to the field AK of type TK, but that record doesn't have those fields, F1 up to Fm. And I don't care about the rest, about the other, the, the, the other fields, right? And so this this symbol called a row is just a variable, a polymorphic variable, which contains the, the, the extra fields. So row polymorphism, the, the reason why PerScript and Haskell support raw polymorphism is that they doesn't support subtyping and with raw polymorphism you get some of the advantages of subtyping, right? We have some of the capabilities of subtyping. There are more of raw polymorphism and there are more of subtyping, but 
they have a kind of over overlapping between the two. So I will show very quickly raw polymorphism on, on an example. What's an advantage of raw polymorphism? If I have a function like this, f, which takes a parameter, which is a record like with two fields, a number, b number, and that function will just sum the value of the two, the, the two, the two fields of my record. I could call that function if, uh, by the way, this is TypeScript syntax, and I will just imagine that TypeScript supports raw polymorphism for my example, but it's not true. So if I call it if an, an instance of my record or if a subtype of it, I will get the I will get the value and the extra parameter the, of my subtype will be ignored. Now, if I define another version of that function with raw polymorphism, for example, so I will take the two first input parameters, a number, b number, and I don't care about the rest. And with the same implementation, I will be able to call the G function with the same values and get the same result, right? Now, if I define that function, H, which takes the same input parameter, but that function will return that input parameter, right? And will add a field to that input parameter with the risk keyword, which by the way does not exist, it's just for example. But that function will add to the X record another field, the field sum, which is the sum of the two first field, right? So if I call it an instance of that record, A1, B2, I will get the same record with an extra field, sum three. If I call it with an instance of a record of that type, with an extra parameter C100, I will get the same record with sum and three. Whereas with regular, with regular inclusion uh, constraints, the, that C field should be ignored and should not appear in the output result. Right, so this is an, an advantage of raw polymorphism. The last kind of polymorphism I want to talk, that I'll, I'll be very quick because I think I'm out of time. It's kind polymorphism. But so before talking about kinds, and I just want to talk about types. So what it, what it, what is a type? A type will be seen as a, a way to classify values, right? So a type could be seen as a set of values. And if I have the value true and false, they belongs to the type Boolean, for example, and the type int, for example, it could be seen as a set of values for the, as the set of zero, one, two, up to infinity, for example. So a kind is similar to a type in in the way that kinds will be seen as a set of type, set of types. And I just want to show an example of type and kinds in NASCAL. So by the way, uh, in that example, I will use two commands, the column T command, which takes a, a value and gives the type of that value. And I have the command, the, the colon K command, which takes a type and gives the kind of that type, right? So if I ask for the type of true, the, the value true, I will get bool because it's a Boolean, right? If I ask for the type of hello, I will get array of Kara. If I ask for the type of array of true, I will get array of Boolean logic. If I ask for the type of the empty array, I will get array of A, A being the type parameter, right? So if I now ask for the type, or for, for the kind of bool, excuse me, I will get star, okay? If I ask for the kind of string, I will also get star. If I ask for the kind of Area of bool, I will get. I will also get star. Just have to remember that the, the kind star is the type of all monomorphic type, all monomorphic types, right? Not only, but all monomorphic types belong to the kind star. And then, if I ask for the kind of the array, array without the type parameter, right? I will get the kind star to star. And why star to star? This could be seen as a function type, right? And this means if you give me a type of kind star, like string or bool, like this example, I will get you a type of kind star. So if you give me bool, I will I will give you a mirror of bool, which is which has kind star. 
So that's the idea that it can polymorphism. And for the last example, I will, not the last, but almost the last, I want to show uh, if I define a value like this ID right there, ID is, an, is a function from A to A. So A is a type parameter. And when defining that value, I'm quantifying over type to define my, my value, right? Now, I want to define a type and that type, I will have a, a parameter. And my type will have only one constructor. So by the way, that proxy type is just a way to tag a value with a type, right? And which is the thing, the interesting thing is that example is that T, that T parameter is actually a kind, it's a kind parameter. And if I create one value, like proxy one, proxy one with proxy value, and I set the type, I set proxy value to the type proxy end, right? T will, will have kind star, right? And if I create this, the, this value, proxy two, and I set proxy value to the type proxy of array. That proxy to that, the, the T, the T can will be star to star. And if I ask now for the type of proxy one, I will get proxy of int. Logic, this is, is that type. If I now ask for the kind of proxy of int, I will get star, logic. If I ask for the type of proxy two, I will get proxy of array, okay. If I ask now, if I, if now I ask for the type for the kind of proxy of array, I will get star. Okay, it's a word, but okay. If I ask now for the kind of proxy, just proxy, I will get k to star. So you see right there that I'm not, I'm not going from star to star. I'm going from k to star. K being a type, k being a, a parameter, kind parameter, right? So that from that that type will work with any kind. And the great news about kind polymorphism is that kind polymorphism is coming in Scala 3. So stay tuned. Uh, for that example of kind polymorphism in Scala 3, uh, so that example is taken from the dot documentation. So, and this is how to define the kind polymorphic function in Scala 3. So for that function, I take a type parameter. That type parameter should be a subtype of any kind. And if you call that function f with an integer of, of kind star, it will work. If you, if you call it with a list of kind star to star, this should work. If you call it with a map from kind star to star to star, this also works, right? So that's in, by the way, you just see that this look like bounded quantification that you just see before, you just saw before, you have just seen before on the, the type level. So this is all for me. This is the some links if you're interested that I use for my from my, my talk. So thank you very much. Thank sure. you very much, Stefan. Um, so I'm going to give you a little clap. I'm sure the audience would love to clap to you. Um, thank you. Oh, okay. So I have so many questions, um, but uh, unfortunately we're out of time. Um, so I think I, I can only pick one of the many that I want to ask you. Um, okay. So you've explored a variety of different type systems here, uh, the ones in Haskell, Scala, and also TypeScript. Um, yes. And there are different things that you can do in each of them. Um, which type system do you prefer? Uh, the type system I prefer is actually Scala. For it, well, it's it's very it's very simple because Scala, uh, Haskell doesn't support subtype doesn't support subtyping, and for for some there are some cases where I really need subtyping. For example, when I want to, to express in my programs um, a hierarchy of error, for example, in, in Scala, we, have, we, could, we could use the ex exception, which is, the, which is an hierarchy given by the type hierarchy given by the, by the, 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 the prelude, prelude like the, the, which is in the, in, into the language. And this is quite useful and in Haskell, for example, if I wanted to to do to do something like that, I will have to to trick with existential types and and so. And TypeScript also is as a is a very interesting language. And but the the, the problem with TypeScript is that there are a lot of 
chip in the type in the type 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 system like false values which uh, I don't like. And by the way, don't get me wrong. Uh, Haskell is very interesting. It's a very interesting language, and I think every everyone should learn a little bit of Haskell because in, for certain so certain concepts, it was easier to grasp them in Haskell because it's it's much more simpler. So, but my preference will go to Pascal. Yeah, and, and I'd second that as well, um, in that uh, there are some times as well where in the Haskell type system, there, there are things I want to do. Um, the different language extensions in Haskell can make the type system quite interesting, of course. Yes. Um, yes. Okay, uh, so now I'm going to uh, direct uh, all the participants and uh, you as well, Stefan, uh, to the Q&A room where you can all ask more questions. Um, I will paste it in the chat. Um, if you go to the Q&A room, uh, feel free to share your uh, audio and video and ask questions. Um, there'll be uh, questions in an unrecorded room, um, so you can be a lot more casual. Okay, I, I, want, I want to say a little, uh, um, a little thing because uh, so something just as this presentation will be available somewhere. I gave the, the, the link to my blog and that presentation is actually uploaded upload to, to my blog. So if you're interested to look at, look at it later. Yes, and what we can do uh, at Scala Lab is that we can uh, share the presentation on our Twitter feed. Uh, so if you follow us on Twitter, um, we will share the presentation and you can have a link to it. We are also uh, recording it, uh, so you can view a recording afterwards, put it up on YouTube. Okay, well, thank you very much, Stefan. Um, thank you please head over to the Q&A room.